Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's crew news conference with members of the Expedition 31 and Expedition 32 International Space Station crews. Joining me are NASA astronaut Joe Acaba, cosmonaut Gadadi Padalka, and Sergey Revin. These three crew members will launch to the space station March 30th of this year, joining Expedition 31 crew members Ole Kononenko, Andre Kuipers, and Don Pettit on orbit. In May, when their Expedition 31 counterparts depart, they will remain on board transitioning to the Expedition 32 crew. Their landing is planned for September. Let me start by introducing NASA astronaut Joe Acaba. Joe was born in Inglewood, California and grew up in Anaheim. He attended the University of California, Santa Barbara and obtained a bachelor's degree in geology and went on to obtain a master's in the same field from the University of Arizona. Joe's diverse background includes serving as a reservist with the U.S. Marine Corps, as well as serving two years in the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic. He went on to manage a marine research center in the Bahamas before becoming an educator, teaching high school and middle school math and science. He joined NASA in May of 2004 and flew his first space shuttle mission in 2009. As a mission specialist on the STS-119 crew, Joe performed two spacewalks, accumulating more than 12 hours of extravehicular activity. We'll now turn it over to Joe to introduce his crewmates. Joe? It really is a, an honor to introduce Gennady Paraka. If I were to talk about all the things that he's done, we'd be here all day. Uh, before Gennady was selected in 1989, he was a military pilot. He has done a, a long duration uh, mission on the Mir space station, two long duration expeditions on the International Space Station. He has 585 days in space, so between all of us, I think we have 600 days in space. And I found out the other night that uh, Gennady has done eight EVAs or spacewalks. So not only will Gennady be the commander of our Soyuz, he's also going to be the commander of Expedition 32. Gennady? Well, let me introduce our flight engineer, Sergei Revin. He's supposed to be a flight engineer on board uh, Soyuz and on board space station. He worked for Russian Space Corporation Energy for 15 years before being assigned as a, our crewmate. It will be his first flight. All right, with that, we'll start with questions here from the Johnson Space Center. If you can please approach the microphone, state your name and affiliation if you have questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Caro from Aviation Week. Uh, the, the number of um, Supply missions going to the space station has increased this year because of um, the shuttle retirement. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how much the coming and going of these spacecraft sort of dominate your activities during your mission. Sure. Uh, right now, we currently have three visiting vehicles that are scheduled. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a couple of uh, progresses that will be coming, and ATV-3 will be undocking. So. A lot of our time is going to be coming, uh, is going to be spent on these visiting vehicles. There's a lot of preparation before they come, once the vehicle arrives, and all of the unpacking. So for us, it's really a, it's a pretty big hit on our time whenever we have these visiting vehicles. So it'll be, a, we're looking forward to it, but it'll be quite a challenge. Hi, uh, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, two quick questions, I guess. One, uh, if, are there any spacewalks planned for this mission? And then, in terms of science, can you give an idea of how um, much of the crew's time is devoted to science now that um, assembly is complete, and what are the uh, any key science experiments that you'll be introducing during your expedition? Uh, we currently have one Russian EVA scheduled, and I'll let Gennady talk about that in a second. Um, and we also have a U.S. EVA that, depending on the vehicle traffic and how the increment goes, and one thing about the long duration flights is there's a lot of uncertainty because of the long period of time. Uh, so we may have one U.S. EVA. And Gennady, if you want to talk about the Russian EVA. Okay. As Joe mentioned, one EVA, Russian EVA, is scheduled for us. Uh, this EVA will be conducted just to transfer Russian cargo boom. Uh, from docking compartment to FGB because we need to continue docking compartment preparation for undocking because to this port MLM will be docked next year. And for your second question, 
Really the main reason that we're up there is to conduct science and now that we are at station complete our goal is to get the 35 hours a week of utilization or time working on experiments. So we plan on putting a lot of time into that. It's really the main focus. Uh, we've got a lot of great experiments going on. A, a couple that I personally like, one is the uh, spheres where you're looking at these uh, kind of floating modules that we have inside and how they interact and how we might use those outside of the space station. And they'll also be used for educational purposes. So that'll be pretty neat. Uh, Robonauts up there. And I met with those guys here at the uh, Johnson Space Center. They're doing a really great job and looking forward to working with them. All right, our next question. Jill Tolk with Houston Aviation Community News. A question for Joe. Since you do have that background as an educator astronaut and you're actually going to have time to work and play a little bit on orbit, what are some leftover tasks or, shall we say, get ahead tasks that you would like to do on orbit in order to reach out to students? Yeah, I believe we spoke before my, my shuttle flight and it was a similar question. And with the shuttle flight, it's really short um, and they're really packed, so I didn't have a lot of time to do education stuff. Again, on a long duration mission, uh, there's still a lot to do, but hopefully now that I'll be living up there for a longer period of time, there'll be more opportunities to do some education components. Um, I'll be up there with Don Pettit, who is just phenomenal. He's a genius and he has a lot of great ideas. So I'm hoping I can piggyback on some of the things that he's doing and bring those back to the students that may be watching. Um, as an educator, I'll constantly be looking to see what we're doing and how that might be related or how teachers might be able to use it in the classroom. So nothing really official, but um, having a longer period of time, I think there's a lot I'll be able to do for the students. Yes, uh, Jim Oberg with, with NBC News. Uh, I'm interested in the training you're doing because you have a, a space station that's been there for a while, it, it's construction complete. What kind of repair work and what kind of contingency work are you training for? Or is there any particular things that in recent months that you've added to your training because of uh, potential issues on the station with the uh, oxygen generator or something else? What kind of repair tasks are you prepared to do that you hope you don't have to do? And one of the reasons why the training is so long is that we're constantly trying to prepare for those things that, that may happen, uh, things that may break. So we cover a lot of that in our normal training flow. Tomorrow, I'll be in the NBL and I'll be practicing some of the contingency EVA uh, tasks that we might do, one being the MBSU. Um, it's, uh, it's operational right now, but if it were to completely fail, that might be something that we have to do real time. So that's kind of been added to my training flow. In terms of inside the station, uh, all of that is covered in our regular training flow. Um, so there's nothing new that's been added for us. And the Russian side? That's for Russian side. Well, currently, nothing is scheduled. I mean, emergency maintenance is not scheduled. But if something comes up, yes, we are ready to repair. You have a tradition of fixing anything. Yes, everything is fixed and no problem for today. And a second question, and also I'd like to get an answer from uh, Novacic, the, our, 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 our new person here. Uh, what are the special things you want to observe on the Earth? As a, as a geologist, I'm sure you have things you want to see overhead with more spare time. And you've seen many, many things. Uh, what is, uh, Gennady, what are some of the things you want to see again? And uh, is there some of the things that you look forward to seeing out, out the cupola? Yes, this question is addressed to me or Sergey? Well, to all three of you. Oh, all three. Geolog. Geolog. In our team, uh, geologist, but I am a physicist. Uh, you can look at the atmosphere. You can look at the ionosphere. Yes. Uh, In spite of the fact that uh, engineer of physic, I am a physicist, I am a physicist. Of course, uh, there is a great interest towards Earth's nature, and it's inexhaustible. And we have a number of experiments uh, that are planned during the session. And we are going to survey the Earth's surface and uh, atmospheric layers, uh, upper atmospheric layers, ionosphere. 
То есть все сферы э, Земли мы будем наблюдать, исследовать и получать, я думаю, достаточно интересные результаты. Uh, we are going to research all the spheres of Earth, and I think we are going to obtain interesting results. Yes, for me, my second education in general ecology, and I would like to continue some science experiments on behalf of ecology. And don't let Sergey fool you. He's a physicist, but he's really a an amateur geologist, and he spends a lot of time outdoors. So I can see Sergey spending a lot of time looking out the window and just enjoying the view. And like you said, as a geologist, I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of these landforms that I learned about in school. Uh, EarthCam, which is a neat project, it'll be uh, it'll be pretty cool to see what the students are interested in and what they what they want to look at, and that'll be also fun to look at. And there's a lot of Earth observations that we do, and you've seen a lot of the pictures that came down from Mike Fossum, and they're just incredible. So I'm looking forward to seeing those for myself. Carrie Feibel, Houston Public Radio. Can you tell us more about the SPHERES science experiment? What is that? And also give us an update on Robonaut. Has it been unpacked? What kind of tasks have been done? And what will you be doing with Robonaut when you're up there? The SPHERES project, you have these, uh, they're probably about this big, and they have a compressed gas. And they're able to locate themselves within the module. We'll have uh, little markers throughout the module. And so by looking at those markers and how they're programmed, they can work in formation and do different tasks. So it might be very beneficial for doing a spacewalk. If there's something you want to look at outside, you can have these move to a certain location and take video of that. So we're doing a lot of practicing with that. They've done many experiments with spheres inside. But this time around, they're going to allow students to actually program what the spheres will do inside the module. Uh, so that'll be cool to see what they come up with. Uh, Robonaut, it has been unpacked. And they're in the early stages of, uh, of operating it. And for me, it was not being a designer, it was painfully slow at how long it takes them to actually do motions for it. They want to make sure everything's safe. So they have a, over a year just to get Robonaut checked out. Um, so our main task will be to get Robonaut out of his closet, somewhere where he can work uh, and observe to make sure everything's going fine. And then depending on how far they get during our increment, uh, there's other tasks that we might be able to do. Um, it, it's a pretty cool project, and I think we're going to see a lot of good results. Thank you. Next question. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. Um, is the uh, ISS as a test bed for analog research, is that still scheduled for your increment? And if so, could you uh, uh, talk about the objectives of that? We're not doing anything specific for that. Uh, things that we do every day, of course, we're using that for um, you know, how we might work when we're doing future missions. Um, there was talk about doing various experiments in terms of time delays, and we may try a couple of those. For example, uh, you may have a day where you're working fairly autonomously from the ground, and instead of calling down on a frequent basis, you may do it only at the end of the day, or they may incorporate some kind of a time delay, which would simulate what we might see on, our way, to, on the way to Mars. Uh, Mark Corral for Aviation Week, and I think this is for Joe. Could you sort of describe uh, when this leg of training in the U.S. began, and what you've sort of what you've been doing here, and what falls out next when you leave uh, Houston, where you go, and where you train up to your launch? When you mean this leg of training, uh, most recently, or the whole? Yeah, no, just the part where you're in Houston now, and what your what the kind of the theme is, and then where you go from here, and where and what you do up to your launch. Sure. Yeah, this is my last training trip in Houston. Uh, I'll head out for Germany uh, in the middle of February on my way to Russia for the launch, and so it's the last opportunity I have to uh, learn about payloads that I haven't seen yet. Uh, there's a lot of baseline data collection for the medical community, so. Uh, if you see me walking down the streets, you'll probably see different things on my body and uh, it might look like a Roman up myself. So a lot of data collection is going on. Of course, I have my Russian crewmates here for two weeks, and we have some emergency training that we'll do together as a crew, but we're also going to work with the other part of our Expedition 32 crew. So we'll get all six of us together to work on that emergency training. So at this point, uh, it's a lot of fine tuning a lot of administrative things that need to get done. But the way we train, I was a backup to Dan Burbank, so the majority of the training has been complete, and now it's just the fine-tuning stage. 
This is Jill Tolk. I also represent uh, Don Pettit's hometown newspaper in Silverton, Oregon. You talked a little bit about him being phenomenal with science, and he spoke before his launch about possibly doing Saturday afternoon science. If you got drawn into that, are there any specific experiments or thoughts or objectives that you personally would like to do if you got pulled into it? I think if I'm fortunate enough to get pulled into Don's experience, uh, experiments, I'm in good shape, and I don't think in my wildest dreams I could come up with the ideas that Don has. So I'm going to take advantage of the two months that I have with Don, and if I can be the person handing him tools um, or things that he can use for me, that would be a, a bonus, and I'm hoping I can learn a lot from him that I can use for the second half of my expedition. Uh, you know, Don is just, he's phenomenal, and he's got a lot of great ideas, so I think I'm going to... I'm going to piggyback on him for a while. Good afternoon. I'm Pedro Rojas. I'm with Univision News. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, what is it like to go to Russia? It's going to be a whole different time zone. How you prepare for that? And uh, how many days would you guys be there before you launch from Russia? It's always uh, great going to Russia. It's a, it's a wonderful place. Uh, they have a great training program. So I'll get to Russia uh, probably around the 25th of February, so a little over a month before we actually launch. Uh, we'll take our final exams and things like that. So I'll have a, uh, a long opportunity to get acclimated and you know to the time differences. Uh, the biggest challenge uh, is that uh, you know I speak a little bit of Spanish. I'm trying to learn my Russian. I'll have some interviews later in Spanish. So it's always a challenge trying to think of what language I need to speak in. So. Bear with me, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, uh, Jim over at NBC again to follow up on some uh, good points. Um, you're training now for a six-month flight. You started out in a two-week flight. Can you talk about the difference in the training for a short and a long flight? And add one more thing. Suppose if you're going to do an analog on the station, and you were asked to do a 500-day flight, like was recently done at the IBMP in Moscow. Uh, but in, in space, how much more different would your pre preparation be for 500 days in orbit? Uh, and especially people who have almost been there, who've been there 500 days or on several different flights, but all together, how much different would that be? Joe? Well, I'll start with the training part. Uh, when you train for a shuttle flight, you know you have two weeks and the mission is very well thought out. You know what the objectives are. So in a little over a year, we can prepare for that. And when you train for a six month mission, there's a lot more you need to learn because there's so many more unknowns that could happen, uh, either with things malfunctioning or just the timing of when visiting vehicles, for example, might come up. So you really need to be prepared for a lot more than you do with the shuttle flight. And if you start looking at the 500 day mission, I think the training in terms of the systems for the space station would be fairly similar. But at that point, I think the, uh, the psychological training might be different uh, if you're looking at 500 days on the space station. I know Sergey, he spent some time on a kind of a long duration analog in, uh, in Russia. And Gandhi, I don't know if you have any words you want to say on spending 500 days in space. No, for me, Joe is quite right. Medi medical preparation and psychological preparation would be the most important for this pretty long duration of flight. For me, I have three flights. And it seems to me I, I have a good experience, but it's not enough to have a good experience. It seems to me it's much better to use this experience well. And I have three flights that I know how to do it. But it seems to me it's a big problem for us, medical preparation, and to be ready. You, you, were, on, you were at IBMP for one of the 110-day flight? You, were you in a test in the air? Was Sergei in the, in, in the yeah. oh, no. So Sergei, you, you did a ground test? I, did uh, I, I took part in experiment, uh, not much. Uh, but we, it was uh, maybe more than 10 years ago. We prepare uh, the SM module uh, life support system. How, how but uh, it was a uh, short uh, expedition. Uh, there, are two, uh, there are two expeditions. Uh, one was about uh, one month, and uh, the other, it was a uh, short expedition, 
uh, and I was a member of this short expedition, 10 days. Uh, it was in uh, not far from Star City. It was a mock-up. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a very interesting experiment and, and uh, a lot of practice work, with a lot of practice job for life support system. And, and of course, the psychological questions uh, were there. And I think uh, as concern uh, the so long expedition, uh, 500 days, uh, it, it is important uh, for this exp expedition is psychological condition of every, uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, psychological condition of the mission control center. And of course, uh, the connection between these teams, because of, uh, I think, uh, the radio connection will model, will model, uh, will, uh, will use uh, not so often, not and use uh, long period. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Psychological aspect is more important mm -hmm. for long duration flight, especially when we have international crew, different traditions, customs, mentality. That is why we have been preparing for a long time to understand each other, to get along. It helps us on the ground. Right. Yes. Carrie Feibel, Houston Public Radio. Could could you follow up, Joe, as well, and um, tell us? You know, you're you've, you're going from a two-week flight to a six-month. What is the psychological training? What are the things that, that teach you? I think listeners would really be interested in learning about that. Um, we don't get a lot, uh, you might be surprised, we don't get a lot of uh, psychological training. Maybe that's good. Um, and we do spend a lot of time together as a crew, uh, which has been really great. And we're very fortunate to have some very experienced crew members on our flight that we can use their experience you know, before we go and even while we're up there. Um, I've had a couple of opportunities, like Nicole said, working in the Bahamas. I was in a pretty remote environment for about a year and a half. So I've had some experience, uh, not quite like this. And, but if the two weeks that I had were any indication, I think the six months are going to fly by. And it's going to be a good time. And talking to the, the folks that have recently returned, the six months is not, it, doesn't, it goes by a lot faster than you imagine. So I, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a, a good time. And, for the record, if you need somebody for 500 days, you can put me on the list. Go ahead. Sure. Another question. Um, what is your confidence in Soyuz operations given the problems um, in the Russian space program with launching uh, last year? Commander. <laughs> oh, today we have no chance for two reasons, because Soyuz, this is the most dependable spacecraft for the last 40 years. And currently, this is only one space vehicle to bring up and to bring down crew, to provide crew rotation. Um, as you mentioned, we had no problem with Soyuz. We had problem with Progress and Rocket. But as you know, the launch of the Expedition 29 was postponed. And unless our management launched another progress. And currently, all problems are resolved, and we are sure no problem is expected. Um, I agree with Gennady, and there was a very thorough investigation that went on, and I know NASA was involved in looking at the results, and everybody is very comfortable with it. We've had a couple of successful launches, uh, so I'm very confident. and. There is a lot of redundancy in the vehicle, and there's a lot that these guys can do as the commander and the flight engineer that if they need to take over manually, they can do that. So uh, I feel very confident, and uh, we're ready for a good ride. Okay. With that, we're going to switch over to the phone bridge where we have three reporters uh, awaiting with questions. We'll start with Anna Kaching with Harvard. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my first question is... Thank <laughs> you. 
missions to Mars. Is it your hope that when they have as international of a crew? Anna, I believe we're having some audio problems. You can maybe try to repeat the question. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, much clearer. Great. Joe, um, you know that children watching your mission are going to be having their own dreams about their missions to Mars in the future. Is it your hope that when they launch to Mars that they have as international crew as you have now? And by way of follow-up to Gonaldi and Sergey, I know that uh, cosmonauts while in orbit um, at space station take the time to speak to children in Russia. Could you take this opportunity to speak to children here in the States? and uh, tell them about why you value international space, um, cooperation and space exploration. Thank you. Yeah, I think for us to go back to Mars and things even more complicated than that, they are going to be international endeavors. And just like within the U.S. NASA astronaut office, we try to have a, a, a diverse group of astronauts, and I think it would be just as valuable, if not more, having you know, a diverse group of astronauts, cosmonauts, because we all have different skill sets. Um, they learn a lot on the Russian side that we don't. We have different systems. And the more that you can have this kind of collective understanding of what's going on, it only helps the mission. So I would envision those kids that are sitting in the classroom today and hope to go to Mars, uh, don't be surprised if uh, you're going to do that with some Russian colleagues. And you'll, you'll have a great time. And I, I wish you the best. And I wish I could go with you. And Sergey and Ganaldi, could you speak to American children about why you value international um, cooperation in space exploration? Because space flight is very risky and a very expensive enterprise. It seems to me it's much easier to to explore the space by doing this with our partners. It's much easier. We can complement, we can supplement each other. I mean, our technologies, our experience, and our space vehicles. And it seems to me in the future, it will be much, much better to explore space together, especially when you're speaking about long duration flight, I mean, Moon, Mars, and then beyond. I would like to admit that, Человечество так устроено, что покидая Землю, мы уже, возможно, не столь сильно различаем национальности или принадлежности к стране. Uh, I would like to observe that once we leave the Earth, we don't notice our differences very much any longer, neither national nor ethnic or other identity differences. Я думаю, если на планете Марс будут марсиане или на другой планете будут свои жители и будут встречать космонавтов, то, соответственно, они будут встречать представителей Земли. And uh, if there are any inhab other inhabitants, let's say the Martians or some other um, inhabitants of other planets, when once they greet astronauts and cosmonauts, they'll be greeting us as Earth inhabitants. И в этом смысле, конечно, взаимодействие между собой, допустим, перед полетом уже будет, то есть будет сформирована одна команда, которая будет представлять, которая будет представлять просто планету Земля. Я так считаю. And uh, I believe that the relationship uh, that we will have, and of course that will be formed before flight, would be one single unified team which will represent planet Earth. At least this is my view. Okay, with that we'll go to Joanna Carver with Metal News Service. Uh, hello, I have a question for um, all three of the crew, and I'd like to know, uh, you know, uh, Joe, in particular, you said that you'd want to go, uh, you'd sign up to be on a 500-day mission, but would any of you want to go to another planet or even another solar system? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Most definitely. I, that, that's, a, that's always been a dream of mine, and to have that opportunity, that's a, one of the easiest questions I'll get all day. I would love to do it. No doubt, I'm ready to move. Я, конечно, безусловно, готов, но было бы интересно еще отрепетировать такой длительный полет, например, 
используя планету Луна, слетать на Луну, побыть там дней 450, ну и обратно. Uh, I'm certainly ready, but would be nice to simulate such an interesting flight and a mission like that and uh, to try it out on the planet Moon and spend about 450 days there. Okay, moving on to our next reporter, Mike Wall with Space.com. Okay, hi guys. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this is just for, for, yeah, for all of you guys. Um, so, so yeah, you're going to miss Dragon's arrival there by, by about a month and a half. Do any of you wish that, like, maybe you could be up there when, when that actually gets up there and um, just to be a part of that historic arrival? I think we all would love to be part of that, um, but it's going to be neat to, uh, to see it from the ground, to see how it behaves um, relative to how we have trained. And hopefully during our increment, we'll have an opportunity to also have one of those visit us. So uh, it, it's always fun to be part of a, a historic moment, but just to be part of the entire training team to see how it goes, how it relates to our training, and then taking that to make our experience that much better it will, will be just fine with us. Okay, with that, we'll return back here to the Johnson Space Center for any remaining follow-up questions. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll wrap up this briefing. For more information on this crew and their mission, please visit our website at www.nasa.gov station. Thank you.